questions. Kesara, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Officials were made aware four years ago of reports of sexual assault by players at Hockey Canada. They did nothing and no one was held accountable. The only thing the Liberals did was to give Hockey Canada another $14 million. For a Prime Minister who claims to be a feminist, there seems to be a pattern of covering up and rewarding bad behaviour. It seems women really don't matter to this Prime Minister. How could the Prime Minister have let this happen? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we have continually stood up to push back against sexual misconduct and harassment uh, in organizations and workplaces across the country. And Hockey Canada is no different. Organizations and people in leadership positions must do their utmost and take decisions to end this culture and trivialization of sexual violence in sport. It's why we commissioned the financial audit to shed light on the use of public funds. We want to get to the bottom of this and all options are being considered to determine the next step. Uh, this behaviour is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, it's a repeat pattern and they're either complicit or incompetent, but either way women are being harmed. Speaker, now these NDP Liberals are going to force a continuation of hybrid, hybrid Parliament for another year. Mm -hmm. Now the Prime Minister and his Liberal Ministers can travel around the world and the NDP can go on junkets, but they don't want to show up here to work. They want to collect a full-time paycheck while doing part-time work. Now it's true the Prime Minister doesn't want to be here because he's afraid of accountability, but the NDP don't want to be here because they're afraid of hard work. Isn't that the truth, Mr. Speaker? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that this pandemic created hardships in workplaces around the country, but indeed, uh, people adapted. And that was one of the innovations that we brought in with a hybrid parliament that allowed people suffering from COVID, people when public health measures kept it safe, uh, from actually being able to work. Uh, I know that there are, uh, there are many more people uh, who continue to benefit from being able to do work remotely. We need to understand that this is a workplace like others and ensuring that there is an ability to do these work uh, in responsible ways uh, while adjusting to the realities of the future is something we'll continue to do. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, the gas station attendant, the factory worker, the nurse, the janitor, the farmer all show up for work. But these NDP, with the help of the Liberals, want to work from the comfort of their homes. How entitled are they? The NDP should be ashamed of themselves for propping up these Liberals and even more ashamed of themselves for not wanting to come to Ottawa to do their job. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing, put an end to hybrid Parliament so that we can all be here in Ottawa? doing our jobs for Canadians. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, how we work in Parliament is determined by uh, parliamentarians working together to determine uh, the standing orders, determine how best to represent their constituents, how best be there for Canadians to debate and, and uh, uh, talk about and pass important legislation. We've seen, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives consistently use obstructionistic tactics uh, to try and slow down gun control measures, to slow down child care, to slow down support for Canadians in every possible way they can. We will continue to do our work to be accountable and engage with Canadians in every way possible. Before we go to the next question, I just want to remind everyone that we want to hear the questions as well as the answers. So I just want to make sure that everybody calms down. I know everybody's excited because next week we're going to be in our ridings and they're looking forward to being with constituents. But right now we're representing them here in the House. So I just want to remind them we want them to be proud of us. The Honourable Member for Meganticlerable. Mr. Speaker, the only person here slowing down Canadians who want to travel is the Prime Minister himself, the only person who's stopping Canadians from having access to an important document, which is a passport in this case, is the Prime Minister's incompetence. This is a national crisis, Mr. Speaker. Mario Dumont spent the whole night at Guy Pavot complex for his daughter's passport. He's saying that they are being treated like cattle. But that's not true, because animals aren't left without water all night. That's the difference between that and Passport Canada. 
How can the Prime Minister be so poor when it comes to delivering products to Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that this situation is difficult and very stressful and completely unacceptable. We know that Canadians have started travelling again and there has been an increase in the number of passport requests. We've created a new centre to increase production capacity. We've hired 600 new members of staff. We will hire 600 more. We have created a new tool for booking appointments online and we will continue to work day and night to deliver more passports to Canadians that this is a problem, we recognise it, and we will rectify it, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lirable. The same answer for the past three weeks, Mr Speaker. Three weeks and absolutely nothing has been done. Passport Canada would process 90,000 passports per week before COVID, and now they can't even do 48,000 a week, Mr Speaker. So where's the problem? All this Prime Minister, all that he touches, turns to mould. It's the same for passports. We're using talking points from two, three weeks ago. The Prime Minister has never had to wait for his passport. He never has to wait when it comes to coming back to the country. And so why does he accept that all Canadians should have to wait? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we do everything we can to make sure that Canadians obtain their passports as quickly as possible. And that's allowed us to uh, hand out over 360,000 passports since April. Staff is, staff is doing overtime every single day and on the weekends to process requests. ESDC is helping us uh, during the weekend. We will continue to do everything that is necessary to rectify this situation for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. We've already said it, Mr Speaker. We are in a madhouse. People that sleep three days outside who are paying fees for delays caused by the government under police supervision. Journalists are being kicked out from passport offices. Can the Prime Minister finally be courageous, grow a backbone and tell the House that he is responsible for this fiasco? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we understand that passport renewal requests have greatly peaked since uh, the end of travel restrictions, and so Passport Canada staff are working day and night relentlessly to deliver passports to Canadians. We understand that people are facing unacceptable delays. This is very difficult, but we will continue to work day and night to rectify the situation, and we will rectify it. The Honourable Member for belle Chambly. He was the only person to guess. Uh, he was the only person who didn't know that there would be an uptick. When he travels, there's a chartered aircraft that is paid for taxpayers. Someone, someone applies for his passport for him, and sometimes his friends even invite him abroad for holidays. But travellers would like to travel. They ask for their passport, and the Prime Minister says, well, maybe you won't get it in time. Before travelling this week, Mr Speaker, would the Prime Minister like to uh, sleep in the rain for two, to two days, waiting for a passport? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, in January we started hiring hundreds of new members of staff for passport services because we saw this coming over the horizon. People have huge requests coming in, a huge number of requests coming in. We are increasing staffing levels. Day after day, we're accelerating solutions when it comes to delivering passports so that Canadians can travel this summer, can go see their loved ones and their family. That is exactly what we want to do. And Mr Speaker, that is what we will rectify for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Over 10,000 days have passed since the people of Nishtanaga have had clean drinking water. Over 10,000 days without something that people count for normal in communities across this country. But for the people of Nishkandiga, they've not had clean drinking water for over two decades. This is a complete and abject failure of leadership. This government has to acknowledge that this failure must be remedied. So when will this government ensure that the people of Nishkandiga 
and all first people of this land have access to clean drinking water. Here, here, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I want to uh, thank uh, the leader of the NDP for asking a question on Indigenous issues on this uh, Indigenous People's Day. Uh, it is extremely important that we deliver uh, clean water to people right across the country. That's why we made a commitment uh, on ending long-term boil water advisories. When we got into office in 2015, there were 109 uh, in place. We have now lifted over 120, but there are more to do. And I can assure you that in every community, where there is a long-term boil water advisory. There is also a plan, a project manager, and the resources in order to lift that uh, drinking water advisory for good. We will continue the work to make sure uh, we're creating real opportunity for Indigenous peoples across this country. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Yesterday, this government announced billions for Arctic defence. Arctic sovereignty is always colonial and patriarchal. The high Arctic relocatees who live in Greece Fjord and Resolute can attest to being sent there without the resources they needed to survive and to thrive. Investments in the North need to help Northerners access safe housing, clean drinking water, and fresh food. Current investments are not working. How will Nunavumu benefit from the billions being invested in Arctic defense? Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know uh, that protection and sovereignty in our Arctic happens and passes through the people who lived there for millennia. And that's why uh, in our investments in uh, northern security, in our investments in NORAD modernization, uh, the uh, Nunavumu, uh, the, uh, the premier uh, of, uh, of Nunavut, uh, P, uh, PJ Achiaguk, uh, and others, uh, including Natan Obed and the ITK, uh, have been involved in these discussions because we know that as we build infrastructure for safety and protection in the north, uh, we need to be hand in hand uh, with the people who live there and create benefits for them as well as we invest in safety in the north. That's what we will continue to do, hand in hand in the true spirit of partnership and reconciliation. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samil Kabin Nicola. Mr. Nick, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance has continually gotten inflation wrong. First, she said deflation was the concern. Then she said inflation was transitory. Wrong and wronger. Now she says that she's considering cutting taxes at the pumps. Good. When Alberta did this, they reduced their inflation rate as higher energy prices drive inflation. Every G7 country is doing something on gas prices. Will, when will she start fighting inflation and give Canadians a break of the pumps, or is she so content to be the wrongest person in the room at the next G7? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the question. And let me just point out that when Canada meets our G7 partners, we are the envy of our peer countries. The IMF, the OECD, and Moody's have all pointed out that Canada is expected to have the strongest rate of growth this year and next year in the G7, and we have the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7 and the fastest rate of fiscal consolidation. When it comes to affordability, our government is taking meaningful steps, starting with the OAS benefit going up this summer. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkini Nicola. Mr. Speaker, these spendy P liberals love warning labels so much, there should have been a mandatory, this product causes inflation and will be harmful to your economy sticker on the last budget. This Minister of Finance is fond of saying that her government can walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, okay then. Can she explain to this House how she can inject a post-COVID-19 stimulus of $100 billion into the economy and fight inflation at the same time. Exactly. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the verdict of some objective experts when it comes to Canada's government policy. And I'm going to start with SP, the ratings agency whose job it is to judge fiscal responsibility. After I tabled the budget in April, SNP confirmed Canada's AAA rating with a stable outlook going forward. And let me also point out that Canada today has is tied with the U.S. for the fastest rate of fiscal consolidation. That means bringing down the deficit in the G7. That is fiscal responsibility, and it's appropriate. 
The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the current NDP Liberal budget spending is the most outside of a crisis in three decades. It's driving runaway costs of living and rising inflation. Food is up 9.7 per cent since last year, the biggest jump since the 80s. Gas is a record high, over two bucks a litre across Canada. It's almost three in big cities like Vancouver and Montreal. It's hard in rural areas too. Since last year, fertilizer's up 44 per cent, feeds up 8 per cent, and farm fuels up 32 per cent. Why don't the Liberals care that Canadians are really struggling right now just to get by? Well, Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely understands the challenges Canadians are facing today with the cost of living. But let me actually remind the member opposite of a statement that one of her colleagues made during the private member statements just a moment ago. One of her colleagues pointed out that higher food prices today are being driven by Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. We have to remember who is responsible for the challenges that Canadians are facing today. Refer Lakeland. The Liberals racked up more debt than every other government before it combined. Wow. That puts all Canadians on the hook, and they're worried whether they can make it. Scotiabank says the Liberals are, quote, doing nothing of any significance to slow inflation at the moment and missed their chance to nip it in the bud, the inflation they caused. RBC and BMO predict tomorrow's inflation to be 7.4% over double from May last year. Liberal spending causes this skyrocketing inflation and forces Canadians to have to choose between heating and eating. Why do the NDP Liberals always make things so much worse for working everyday Canadians? Here, here. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me take another opportunity to point out to Canadians listening to us that Canada is tied with the United States in the G7 for the fastest rate of fiscal consolidation, the fastest rate of bringing down our deficit. And Mr. Speaker, Canadians know inflation is a global phenomenon. It's driven by Putin's war in Ukraine. It is driven by China's COVID zero policies. And I'll give you some numbers to back that up. Our latest inflation number is 6.8% in Canada. That's lower than the US, which is at 86 Germany at 7.4, the UK at 9%, and the OECD average of 9.2%. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Daniel Leblanc, Radio Canada, tells us another good thing about this government. This morning, the Revenue Agency's investigation into the KPMG tax evasion scheme was completed one year ago. One year ago. They confirmed that they had been exonerated. The Minister of National Revenue said, we'll catch them. This will be much sim simple when they are caught. Simple question. Why has she known that there was a conclusion for one year without telling anyone? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased and very surprised to hear that my colleague across the way seems suddenly very interested in fighting tax evasion. He no doubt knows that I cannot make comments on specific cases. What is more, my colleagues should know that the agency is independent when it comes to its investigations and inquiries. I do not intervene in any of them, and I don't control what they do. We will continue to work vigorously to f in the fight against tax evasion here in Canada and abroad. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Oh, Mr. Speaker, as the same minister who for weeks was saying, well, the trapdoor is closing. The reality is that she is the one closing the trapdoor on herself. Because in 2017, she said that she would publish the information publicly. But the investigation ended a year ago. The minister said that everything will be clearer when it's published. But for a year, she has said absolutely nothing. Why, once again, is the government refusing to be transparent? When it's time to talk, they don't talk. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I have already mentioned, I cannot make comments on specific cases. My colleagues should know that the agency is independent. We do not intervene in their investigations, and we do not tell them what to do. Mr. Speaker, thank you. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, 
The situation is getting out of hand at passport offices, and Tivia tells us that at the end of this ordeal, the lucky ones who do actually get their passports at the Guy Favreau complex in Montreal are still being charged extra fees. Despite the minister's instructions, Canadians and Quebecers are still being charged $110. Despite the minister's instructions, the federal government is making Quebecers and Canadians pay for, their mis for its mistake. The minister has no control over their department. When will they finally ensure that citizens get their passports without undue fees? The Hon Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to reiterate to my colleague that all employees for Service Canada have been told that if passports are outside of standard services, then there will be no supplemental fees. We will reiterate this. It is clear. It has been instructed to all offices in the country, and we'll make sure that it is implemented in the field. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, about as clear as mud. People are being treated like cattle at passport offices. And instead of managing the crisis efficiently and effectively, we've learned that security at the Guy Favreau complex decided to expel a journalist who was reporting on the state of the waiting lines. Mr. Speaker, if the situation degenerates to the point of being embarrassing to show on screen, the solution is not to chase the media away. It is to better manage the crisis. When will the government increase hours, redeploy public servants, treat Canadians and Quebecers decently, and make sure that everyone gets a passport? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The situation in Montreal is unacceptable. I have learnt this, I've learnt from this, and it is clear that this is not what should happen. I can reassure my colleagues that now in Montreal, everyone who is going to travel in less than 48 hours will get their passport. Triage is done in the waiting line, and senior management is there in the field in order to manage this situation, which is a huge volume, but an unacceptable volume nonetheless. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, just last week the Minister for Finance made an announcement on inflation without a single penny for our farmers and producers. We have been warning her for months that agriculture is in danger. Inflation is hitting three times over. Fuel, fertilizer, and feed prices are skyrocketing, adding yet another 1.5 billion to the bills of farmers and producers. If Ottawa does nothing, producers and farmers will go bankrupt and food prices will rise even higher. Farmers have been making concrete demands of the minister. When will she finally support them? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I, would, I do agree with my colleague that our farmers and producers are working tooth and nail. And like everyone else, they are facing very high prices for feed, for inputs, and for energy. And that is the reason for which we have helped them in many ways. We've had the biggest budget in history at the Agriculture Department, $4 billion for the agricultural sector, and we are working on various different options to find out how we can even better help farmers and producers. For Edmonton with Taskowin. Mr. Speaker, the utter chaos experienced by Canadians simply trying to obtain a passport from their own government is a crisis solely of this Prime Minister's making. A summer that should have provided much needed relief after two years of significant stress is instead turned into an endless nightmare of dangerous passport office all-nighters and infuriatingly long hold times often ended in abruptly dropped calls. A year ago, as this fully predictable situation was brewing, the Prime Minister called a completely unnecessary election. Will he now admit that he was wrong to put his political interests ahead of the Canadians he's elected to serve? Honourable Minister of Families. As I've mentioned several times in this House, we are experiencing an unprecedented volume in terms of passport applications. Uh, we have, in fact, been planning for this surge, and in fact, that's why 600 employees were hired since January. Another 600 are in the process of being hired. We are rearranging uh, and reallocating resources both within Service Canada, but also from other government departments. Mr. Speaker, we understand the situation, we understand the frustration of Canadians, and we will continue to do everything that we can to support Canadians get their passports in a timely fashion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Grand Prairie, Mackenzie. 
Mr. Speaker, Sally still hasn't received her new passport she applied for in March. She needs it next week. The government says that she can now travel five hours to the nearest pa passport office to get an emergency passport printed. They've told her to line up at 4 a.m., but won't guarantee that she'll get served that day. They've also said that she must not arrive at the passport office sooner than 48 hours before her flight time in order to qualify for the said emergency printing. Why does Liberal incompetence mean that Sally is forced to drive five hours one way to stand in line all night with no guarantee that she'll have her passport by the time her flight leaves. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are currently triaging people in line because of this unprecedented volume to ensure that people don't miss their flight. We have uh, ensured that when people get to the passport office that they are receiving their passports. That member opposite can certainly work with my office to support that constituent. I've been pleased to work with many uh, members opposite to support their constituents to make sure that they can get their passports on time, and we will continue to support them and Canadians as we go through the surge in volume to support Canadians with their passports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, everybody's being rather good, except we've got a couple of people with very strong voices. I, I, I would encourage them to whisper across the floor like everyone else. The Honourable Member for Montmagny-Lille Lake and Moraska, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, the passport crisis is simply shocking and unacceptable. Mario Dumont from TVA said, the government is treating Canadians like cattle. Cattle, Mr. Speaker. Imagine, people are exasperated. They are desperate. But the minister, oh, no, 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 everything's fine. She's been ripping the same platitudes from the very beginning. All staff have to come back to the offices, to open the offices, to be there on the weekend, not just on a, an appointment basis. When will the minister finally rectify the problem? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, I understand the frustration of Canadians. We are currently implementing all efforts in order to rectify the situation, and I must correct my honourable colleague from across the way, because all staff working on passports in, with Service Canada are in the office in person, and they have been there for months, Mr. Speaker. And when the honourable member talks of public servants working from home, well, they are also working. It's the same public servants who offered served to Canadians, 9 million Canadians who received benefits for workers who are working very hard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Niagara West. Wherever we look these days, we see the NDP Liberal government in chaos. If it's not chaos at our airports, it's chaos at our passport offices. Every week, dozens of constituents call my office looking for help. People have been waiting since January with little to no response. People are lining up overnight just to get to the office. Some are even being turned away and asked to come back another day after waiting for hours. Mr. Speaker, what other G7 countries have their citizens sleeping on the ground overnight in order to receive basic government services. Out. In fact, this is not a situation unique to Canada. In fact, the United States, the UK, France, uh, Australia, Sweden are waiting between 10, 11, up to 27 weeks. Uh, this is precisely something that is happening right around the world. It doesn't make it acceptable here, and that's exactly why we are throwing everything we have to fix this situation, to ensure that we can do this better. But there are almost all of our peer countries are going through the exact same thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. KPMG literally counseled the wealthiest Canadians to use offshore tax havens. They told Canadians, put your money into your assets into the Isle of Man tax-free haven and then we'll help you recover them tax-free. Sounds pretty shady to me. Also sounded shady to the CRA. So they launched a criminal investigation which found that there was no wrongdoing which clearly means we need to change the laws. So when will this government finally change the laws to make sure the wealthiest Canadians aren't able to use offshore tax havens and avoid paying their fair share and actually start contributing fairly like the rest of Canadians do? The Honourable Minister of Revenue. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very pleased to see how enthusiastic my colleague is in fighting tax avoidance. The CRA will continue fighting tax evasion both in Canada and abroad. We have a solid network of tax agreements. 
our investments are showing results. It is increasingly difficult to hide money abroad, Mr. Speaker. I have a simple message for all those who are thinking of committing tax evasion. The CRA will find you wherever you are. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Effective. KPMG advised people in Canada to use tax loopholes. The government has the power to end the legislation that permitted that type of action. Will the government finally do something to change the law to ensure that businesses pay their fair share, just like everyday Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to tell my colleague that the CRA is independent. I do not intervene in inquiries. I do not direct them. But it is a priority for our government to continue to work to fight tax evasion. That is why we have invested more than $2 billion, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work hard to counter tax evasion and avoidance. Yukon. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of National Defence announced our government's plan to modernise our continental defences, including replacing the North Warning System. Through this plan, our government will invest in state-of-the-art capabilities so that we can modernise and enhance our ability to defend Canadians against new and emerging threats. This modernisation will benefit all Canadians and all North Americans. Can the Minister please outline the importance of moving forward with these investments, as well as the importance of doing so in partnership with Northern and Indigenous communities when investing in the defence of the North? Great question. Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Yesterday, our government announced the largest investment in continental defence and NORAD in four decades, Mr. Speaker. And as part of that, we will, we will ensure that we partner with Indigenous communities in multiple areas, including in the area of infrastructure. We need to make sure that they are together with us in terms of the investments that we will make to keep Canadians safe and to ensure that our Canadian Armed Forces have the resources and the supplies that they need, Mr. Speaker. The safety and security of Canadians is our top priority. Here, here. Well, member for Cumberland, Colchester. This government continues to interfere with democratic process. The SNC-Lavalin scandal, and now we see, based on the Mass Casualty Commission, that the public, then Public Safety Minister and the Prime Minister put pressure on Commissioner Lucky. Why did the Prime Minister and the Public Safety Minister use the death of Canadians to advance their political agenda? Honourable yeah. Minister for Public Safety. Speaker, first and foremost, uh, I want to express on behalf of the government, and I hope all members of this chamber, our sympathies and our condolences to the families of the victims. Uh, I had the opportunity. I'm just going to make a comment. It's shameful I can't hear what's being said. So I just want to remind everyone to really just keep your voices down so we can hear the answer. From the top, uh, Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for uh, creating some pause in this chamber. As I express, I hope on behalf of all members, our condolences and our sympathies with the families of the victim, some of whom I've had an opportunity to meet with. Um, this continues to be a very difficult uh, moment for them. Uh, in the interim, uh, we know that the Public Commission is doing its important work independently of government. Uh, there needs to be due process. There needs to be a trauma-informed process this. And at the end of the day, we will do whatever we can to support that process so that there can be justice for the families they deserve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear from recent news reports that the Mass Casualty Commi Commission confirms that the Prime Minister and the then Public Safety Minister interfered with, sadly, Mr. Speaker, the release of numbers of, release of, numbers of casualties. We know that what the quote says is that in reference to victim numbers, that is 100 per cent Minister Blair and the Prime Minister. Isn't that true, Mr. Speaker? Here, here. I just want to remind the honourable members when referring to someone else in the chamber, refer to them as their title but not by their name. The honourable minister for public safety. Minister for Emergency Preparedness. 
Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm very happy to advise this House that this issue has already been dealt and, and with the Mass Casualty Commission, in which the Commissioner of the RCMP has confirmed for the Commission that no such direct direction or pressure was ever exerted by me or by any other member of this government. But, Mr. Speaker, among the important work of, of the Mass Casualty Commission is examining a number of the significant communication challenges that that, that event in, involved. We look forward to have to stop the minister. I'm having a hard time, and I'm about 20 feet away from the minister. So I'm going to ask everyone to be quiet and maybe ask the minister to take it from the top, because I, I, I miss most of that. The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to advise this House that this matter was dealt with a number of months ago, in which the Commissioner of the RCMP has confirmed for the Mass Casualty Commission that no such direction or pressure was ever exerted by myself or any other member of this government. But, Mr. Speaker, among the most important work of the Mass Casualty Com Commission is to examine the important communication challenges that were evident during this tragic event. We look forward to a fact-based findings and recommendations for improvement. Well, member for Barry Innisfil. Okay, so Mr. Speaker, this is, this is critical because according to the Commander's notes uh, in the Mass Casualty Commission report, the Commissioner Lucky promised the Prime Minister's office and the Public Safety Minister's office that they would release the information in an active investigation that, that, she, was in, that she was discussing. It would appear that somebody from the Prime Minister's office and the Public Safety Minister's office was directing Commissioner Lucky to interfere in an active police right. investigation when the investigators on the ground said they didn't want to. Who in the PMO and the Public Safety Minister's office directed Commissioner Lucky? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to confirm that no one in the, in the Prime Minister's office or the, the Public Safety Office exerted any pressure or direction on the Commissioner of the RCMP. The Commissioner of the RCMP engaged with her officials and she has already confirmed for the Mass Casualty Commission that no such direction or pressure was ever given by any member of this government. Member for Barry Innisfil. Mr. Speaker, that is contradictory evidence according to the Commission's report. According to the commanders on the ground, Commissioner Lucky became extremely upset that the commissioners were not releasing the information in an active investigation, despite the fact that the commanders on the ground said they weren't willing to do it because it would compromise the investigation, Mr. Speaker. So again, I ask somebody in the Prime Minister's office, somebody in the Public Minister's office directed Commissioner Lucky to get that information. Who was it? Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner of the RCMP is in, in, in her operations of, of her police service is entirely independent of government, and I can confirm for, the, for this House and as the Commissioner has also confirmed that no such direction or pressure was exerted by any member on this government to influence the Commissioner's exercise of her authorities over her police service. Honorable Deputy de the Honourable Member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, if you owe the CRA 20 bucks, they'll chase you down. But not companies like KPMG that help millionaires hide their income on the Isle of Man, a tax haven. We learned this morning that they were exonerated by the CRA, whereas in the States, for the same financial scheme in 2005, KPMG was fined and nine executives had criminal charges brought against them. But here in Canada, not even a slap on the wrist. Why is the minister letting these companies use tax havens with impunity? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will say once again to my colleague across the way that more than $2 billion have been invested since 2015 in fighting tax evasion. But if my colleague wants to have a real impact on the results of inquiries, well, I'll be very pleased to send him a letter of reference so he can become an RCMP investigator. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, in 
in 2017, when the minister was asked if charges would be brought against KPNG, she said yes, because people who create these schemes are also doing something criminal. But today, the CRA is letting them slip through its fingers. The minister is letting the fraudsters and KPMG get away with it. That's unacceptable. Under the act, the minister can ask for a new inquiry and have an external investigator lead it to cast light on the situation. Will she personally order that inquiry? Or will she simply accept that KPMG orchestrate this tax of avoidance on the Isle of Man? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, tax evasion and avoidance and fighting them have always been a priority for our government. I'd like to educate my colleague across the way because he's new, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell him that the CRA is an arm's length agency. I do not manage inquiries and I am not leading them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday at Heritage Committee, it was revealed that in June of 2018, a senior official at Heritage Canada was made aware of the allegations of sexual assault at Hockey Canada. Yet for four years, the government continued to give Hockey Canada millions of taxpayer dollars while no action was taken to hold anyone accountable or address the dangerous culture that enabled harassment and assault. Mr. Speaker, for four years, Hockey Canada continued to receive millions. Why? Good question. <laughs> Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, when Hockey Canada stated that there was a case in 2018, they told Sports Canada that this had been transferred to the London police. And now that we are aware of the allegations and that there has been a settlement, I've asked for a financial audit to ensure that no public funds were used to hide the story. It is a heinous situation and this is not the end. For Lethbridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're on a journey. That was the quote used by Hockey Canada yesterday at Heritage Committee when they were asked questions with regards to the cover-up culture that is so a part of their institution. Specifically, they were asked questions with regards to an alleged sexual assault case involving gang rape by eight players. The response, we're on a journey, seemed trite and altogether inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So my question for the minister is, I just simply would like to know, are you happy with the response that was received yesterday? And if not, what tangible actions will be taken immediately? Before we go to the Honourable Minister, I just want to remind everyone in the House that to put their questions through the chair, not directly to each other. Honourable Minister. Canadians, I'm disgusted and horrified by this situation, and I am not satisfied with the explanation by Hockey Canada yesterday. This is why. <laughs> this is why we will conduct a financial audit to make sure that no public funds were used, and I'm looking at all the options to move forward in this case. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, yesterday, I think we heard damaging testimony from Hockey Canada in relation to that horrendous allegations of an alleged sexual assault that happened some four years ago. Hockey Canada needs to own this. My fear is that someday, some of these players will become coaches. To the sports minister, the department was notified some four years ago of these allegations. So why did the minister continue to continue the issue of funding to Hockey Canada for the last four years? Here, here. Honourable Minister for Sports. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, as I said, a financial audit will be carried out to ensure that no public funds were used to cover up this affair. Like all Canadians, like my colleague, I am horrified by what we heard yesterday. We will ensure that Hockey Canada is held accountable. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Laval, Les Îles. Mr. Speaker, the G7 culture ministers held their first meeting this weekend to discuss issues and challenges in the areas of culture and media. I will interrupt the Honourable Member match going back and forth between a couple of MPs. I don't want to point them out, but I do want to ask them to control their their emotions, I guess, for lack of a better word, their anger. 
I will ask the honorable member to start over. Mr. Speaker, the G7 culture ministers held their first meeting this weekend to discuss issues and challenges in the areas of culture and media. That meeting was essential to enable G7 countries to cooperate on protecting and promoting our cultures and democracies. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage tell us about how Canada is playing an important role as a global leader in these, in these areas? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. That's a very good question for my colleague, much better than the opposition's. I'd like to thank my colleague for his incredible work. Now, I would say that our G7 allies are very interested by our legislation on culture and democracy, in especially C18, for web giants to compensate journalists because there's the same problem throughout the world. Web giants use our journalist content without paying for it. That needs to change, and we will do that with our allies. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisville. Mr. Speaker, there can be little doubt that there was political interference from the Prime Minister's office and the Public Safety Office, Minister's office, because of the handwritten notes by Darren Campbell, a superintendent panel in Nova, uh, or superintendent in the RCMP in Nova Scotia. In his notes, he wrote. The Commissioner said she had promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's office that the RCMP would release this information, release information in an active investigation that could have jeopardized the investigation. Who in the Prime Minister's office, who in the Public Safety Minister's office authorized Commissioner Lucky to speak to the RCMP? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, the answer is no one. And secondly, perhaps, perhaps the, the, the member opposite isn't aware that the Commissioner of the RCMP is the Commissioner of the RCMP and doesn't require any authorization from anyone else to speak to her own organization. But, Mr. Speaker, what is also clear, and the, commis the Commissioner has made very clear to the Mass Casualty Commission, is that no pressure, no direction, no orders were given by, by any member of this government to her in doing her job of running her organization. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisville. This is not funny, Mr. Speaker, because in his notes in particular, the Nova Scotia R RCMP superintendent said that Lucky had accused them of disobeying her instructions to include specific information on the firearms used by the perpetrator. In his notes, Campbell also wrote that he told the RCMP strategic communications not to release information right. about the perpetrator's firearms out of concern that it would jeopardize the investigation. The RCMP commissioner said that she had received instructions from the Prime Minister's office and Mr. Blair's public safety office, Mr. Blair's public safety office, to interfere. We brought it up. It's nice, but when it gets brought up again, I understand the drama is good for TV, but it's not good for this chamber. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's very apparent that the, the, the Leader of the opposite, the House and the Opposition is more interested in drama than in truth. M Mr. Speaker, th there is a fact here. The Commissioner has confirmed that no direction and no pressure was given by me or by any member of this government to direct her in any way. Mr. Speaker, this is a line of which I am most familiar. And no direction of an operational matter was given to the Commissioner of the RCMP by myself or any member of this government, and she's confirmed the truth of that. Member for Barry Innisfil. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but, but this is not drama. This is about a police commissioner actively... The Honourable Member for Barry Innesville. The question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I do apologize, but this is not drama. This is about a direction to a police commissioner of the RCMP to actively be involved in a case, an ongoing investigation in Nova Scotia, from the Prime Minister's office to the Public Safety Minister's office. That's the action. That's the accusation that has been made in this case, Mr. Speaker. So it is a serious matter that police are investigating or are actively investigating something, and they're being told by the Prime Minister's office and the Public Safety Minister's office that the commissioners to interfere. Who told them? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said many times already today, and as I'll say again, no one told the RCMP Commissioner to, to, and gave her any direction or exerted any pressure. Mr. Speaker, the, the conversations that the Commissioner has with her subordinates in her organization is entirely independent of government, and the Commissioner is doing her job, but she has already confirmed for the Mass Casualty Commission a, a public inquiry intended to get to the facts of this matter that no such direction was given by any member of this government. The Honourable Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek. It's like Oliver Stone. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Canada is a trading nation and a strong proponent of the international rules-based multilateral trading system. That being said, Canada is always driving forward to find solutions, even at a time when global trade is facing unprecedented challenges, especially at the World Trade Organization and Canada's leadership with the Ottawa Group. As the Minister of International Trade, Export Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development just returned from the WTO last week, can she give us an update on the outcome of the 12th Ministerial Conference? Minister. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member from Hamilton East Stony Creek for that question. Canada is indeed a trading country. One out of six jobs depend on international trade. I just returned from a historical ministerial conference at the World Trade Organization where we reached several multilateral agreements with all 164 member countries unanimously. Let me give you a couple of highlights. We worked to adopt a response to the COVID-19 pandemic so that the WTO can be more resilient in future pandemics, including reaching a consensus on the TRIPS waiver. We also reached an agreement so that we can work on the impasse of the appellate system, which Canada and our companies depend on so much. This is multilateral trading at its best, and it's a good day for internet. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' failure to fund a single new shelter or transitional home since announcing their violence prevention strategy in 2020 is putting Indigenous women, girls, and gender-diverse people at risk. And this inaction is costing lives. We need oversight. Call for Justice 1.7 of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls calls for an independent ombudsperson and tribunal to ensure accountability. When will the minister implement this call for justice? Honourable Minister, or the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, addressing the ongoing violence against Indigenous women, girls, and 2SLGBTQ+, is a whole-of-government approach which requires living up to our goals as a country and all the calls for justice. That is why Budget 2021 put $2.2 billion over five years to address the, the violence towards missing and murdered Indigenous women. We will ensure our initiatives are trauma-informed and focused on those who are still suffering in silence, as well as those who are courageously speaking out to put an end to this strategy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Griesbach. This government says that housing is a human right, but in my riding of Edmonton Griesba, the lack of housing is an emergency. In the last three years alone, 453 people have died on the streets of Edmonton because they didn't have shelter, many of whom are Indigenous. Under this government, the issue is getting worse. The Liberals are more interested in big developers' profits than putting a roof over people's heads. People in Alberta Ave and across my community aren't seeing results. When is this government going to drop the talking points and build homes for people that they can't afford? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the Honourable Member's uh, concern and uh, important question on this issue. We've invested uh, in the Rapid Housing Initiative, for example, a program that is aimed at the most vulnerable. And, uh, the member the city of Edmonton has actually benefited uh, to the tune of hundreds of permanently affordable new homes for the most vulnerable. 
through our investment in the co-investment fund and our uh, expected investments through the housing accelerator fund, even bringing forward future money to this year to get more money out the door is to the tune of uh, 22,000 new affordable homes for the most vulnerable. There's more work to be done, but we've made a lot of progress, Mr. Speaker. That's all the time we have for today. C'est tout le temps que nous avons. It being at 3.14, pursuant to order made on Monday, June 20th, 2022, there is an agreement between the parties to have some brief statements at this time. Je donne maintenant la parole à l'honorable député de Mégantic. I now recognize the honorable member for Mégantic-Lérable. Merci, Monsieur le Président.